chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, Revelation chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, and I'm going to key up on a phrase here, and we're going to plow into this. I have some new things the Lord gave me this morning to share with you, along with some of the things I've been sharing the past couple weeks. Revelation chapter 10, as you know, there are seven churches in Asia Minor, which today is the country of Turkey, and Jesus addressed all seven of these with messages. And this particular church, he says something very interesting to them that I want to focus on. Chapter 3, verse 8 through 10. I know your works. See, I've set before you an open door, and no man can shut it, for you have a little strength. Notice that word strength there. You have a little strength. But you've kept my word and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not. Indeed, I will make them to come and worship before your feet and know that I've loved you. Now, watch this. Because you have kept my command to persevere, or as King James says, because you've kept the word of my patience, because you've been able to keep standing is what he's saying. I'm going to keep you from the hour of trial. King James says hour of testing, which shall come upon the whole world to test those, pay attention, to test those who dwell on the earth. Whatever this is that he is predicting here affects the entire earth and it becomes a test for the entire planet. Now, I want to do a little word study here on several of the words. Most of you that follow us on our program know that one of my things I enjoy doing the most is doing word studies. The word strength here comes from a Greek word dunamis. And that word is used in the New Testament Greek Bible for like you shall receive power, dunamis, after the Holy Spirit comes on you, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And what it refers to is the ability to have the power of seeing miraculous things, miraculous answers to prayer, miracles, healings, deliverances. So he says, now you've come to a place where you're not operating in the dunamis level that you previously operated in. You and I know if you grew up the way I did, we do not see the level of miracles or answer to prayer the way the old timers talk about. Does anybody know what I'm, where I'm going with this? So you have a little strength. There's a little dunamis left. Then he says this, because you have kept the word of my patience, I am going to keep you from the hour of testing. You've kept my command to persevere. That word kept is from a Greek word. And also in the uh, Old Testament, this word keep is very familiar. That means to guard from loss. You have put a guard in front of a treasure house to prevent a thief from coming in and taking the treasure that was there. So this word kept, kept, kept uh, one of the uh, other words that can be used it, uh, it is it, it, going to be kept from the hour of testing can mean here to withhold you from the hour of testing, which is going to come upon the entire earth. Now, this phrase, hour of testing, in the King James is translated the uh, hour of temptation. And actually, the word testing is a better word to use in this context than the word temptation. Because we think of temptation as being moral temptation, uh, physical temptation, mental temptation. But this is a different word. This particular word, kept from the hour of temptation... Uh, the root is the Greek word parazo, parazo. Parazo is a word found in the New Testament. Now remember, the New Testament's written in the Greek language, but it's a word found in the Greek language that refers to, now this is important, piercing a vessel, piercing a vessel to test it, piercing a vessel to test it. Now, you are compared in the Bible to a type of vessel. You have vessels of clay, vessel of silver, vessels of gold. You are at different levels in your spiritual walk, which determines the value that you have as a vessel that's filled with the presence of God and the Word of God. What does perazzo mean? It's three things. Now pay attention to this. You pierce the vessel to test the strength of it. You pierce the vessel to test the strength of it. The second way the word parazo is used in classical or ancient Greek is for, uh, uh, to test the vessel, vessel to see if it can hold up to what is placed in it. If the walls of a clay vessel are too thin, and I have hundreds of them in my office that are authentic, they can crack that easy. 
they have to be equal all the way around. They have to be thick. It has to be able to hold the water or the oil or whatever substance is placed in it. The third reason that you parazzo a vessel is to see, this is important, if somehow there is a leak in it, that if you put something in it like the oil of the water or, or uh, the, the grape juice, that it has a crack that slowly leaks out. I am very disgusted at a set of cups that my wife got that are plastic. I've never seen cups like this because you have an Albert cup with a gap and then you have a cup on the inside. Now, why there is a space of air between that, I have no idea. And several times I have taken my metal spoon and busted the inside of that cup. And so this is the idea of parazza. Will the pressure that's being placed on the vessel cause it to break? Will it cause it to crack? Uh, will it be able to hold what it's being able to hold? So this is to keep you from the hour of testing, the hour of temptation, the hour of parazzo, that which is going to test the vessels. God said, I will keep or I will preserve you, my, 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 during this time of the vessels. I just got to go ahead and sidetrack here. If you've never been in service with me before, you know that I'm a rabbit trail man, that I get off the path and jump on a trail. There is, in the, in the time of the Jeremiah the prophet, and even in, up in the time of Christ, there were clay vessels all over the place. If a clay vessel was baked and was weak, do you know what they would do to it? They literally would throw it into what's called the potter's field. The potter's field is in the Kidron Valley, outside the walls of Jerusalem, the old days, and it's where pottery was made. There were all sorts of potters and homes and, uh, that had businesses there. And so you would just literally take the baked vessel, if it cracked or broke or chipped, you just throw it down there and it's trampled underneath the feet. By the way, when Judas realized he had betrayed the Lord and there was no hope, where did he hang himself ready in the Keldama, the potter's field? Because he knew there was no chance of that vessel ever coming back. Come on, did anybody just get what I said? Judas who betrayed the Lord. Now, if a very valuable vessel, something valuable, had a crack in it, you could not just put clay in it and let the clay dry. Example is a pothole in a road. How many of you have had potholes in Oklahoma? Come on, we got them in. Tennessee is the pothole state. Okay, that's my nickname. They're everywhere. And so if you've ever noticed, they take asphalt and put it in the hole. What happens about four months later? It's back where it was because it doesn't bond with the other previous asphalt that was laid. All right, this happens in vessels. So how, you'll love this. So if a vessel was cracked, if a vessel was broken, how did you seal that vessel up? And the answer is really weird. There was a tick a blood sucking tick that was that, that was would suck the blood from a sheep it would get in the wool of the sheep and the person that wanted to fix the vessel had to take several of these ticks crush them up with the wet clay mm -hmm, then stick it into the vessel and put it back in the kiln and the only way that a broken vessel could get fixed is some blood from a lamb And it was the, for some reason, the substance that was in that blood was the sealant that sealed to the actual part of the old previous vessel. Now, that, that, that's, a, that's a little addition to the message. Now, let me go back to this idea, and we're going to break this down of the hour of testing, because in the New Testament, there are three levels of testing, and they are the following. A common test, a seasonal test, and a testing hour. And you can write that down any way you wish. What is a common test? It is found in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There is no test or temptation taking you but such as common to man, but God will not allow you to be tempted above that which you were able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that you might be able to bear it. A common test is a test that everybody has to go through. Everybody, in my opinion, gets discouraged at times. So you are tested with discouragement. You get depressed or oppressed at times. So you are tested with that. You encounter fear at times. So you may be tested by a fear. But it's something that everybody has to go through. And when you say you're dealing with it, here's what they say. Man, I understand because I've been through that too. So that's common testing. Second level is seasonal. Where is seasonal? 
When Satan tempted Jesus uh, in, uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4 in the Judean wilderness during 40 days, Luke says this. He talks about the testing, and he says Satan, at the end of 40 days, departed from Jesus for a season. Now, that is not found in Matthew chapter 4. It's found in Luke chapter 4. What is the season? The Greek word season is the word kiros, and that is where we get that word. You've heard that preached on an opportune moment, a season of opportunity. We would translate that today that after the 40 days were up, Satan departed from Jesus until a more appropriate season would come. You will read... He preached for three and a half years, if you study it out. So in the beginning of his ministry, the Satan said, are you the son of God? That was the test, to test his identity, to make him question who he was. He gets in the middle of that three and a half years, and what's the big argument? Who do men say that I am? And it was Peter that said, you're the son of God. And, of course, the Pharisees doubted that. Then... You get to the end of his ministry, and what do you come to? You come to the men at the cross saying, if you're the Son of God, save yourself. If you're the Son of God, come down. Now, I don't know if you see what I see in those three examples, but this is the enemy first showing up as Satan to test, then using the Pharisees to question him, then using the people at the cross, including a thief, to question him. So throughout his ministry, Satan would return with the same question, who do you think you are? Are you really the Son of God? If you are, why don't you put on a display and why don't you prove it? That is what's called a seasonal test. Another way of calling this test is cyclical per perazos. In other words, sick cyclical piercings, cyclical testings. What do I mean by that? I'll give you an example. Let's say that you have had a habit in your lifetime. You've, you've, you've dealt with the habit. All right, you get completely free from it. Then all of a sudden, what happens six months later? Uncle, Uncle Jojo and Aunt Boo Boo come over, and they visit you, and they have the same habit you have. Next thing you know, you're smelling something, or, or they're, 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 they got a substance around you, and you start getting the feeling that you desire that again. That's a cyclical test. Now, let me tell you the good thing about a cyclical test. It does not matter that if you've been delivered from something and six months or a year later, you're hit with it again, you're delivered uh, from that, and about six months later, you hit with it again. Here's the good thing about a seasonal testing. This too shall pass. Hey, so in other words, Whatever season you are in, if you can hold on for a day, two or three days, sometimes it'll last a week, I promise you that the enemy will leave for the next appropriate season. What you've got to do is stand having done all to stand, according to Ephesians chapter 6. Now the third, now this one is where we, this is where we get into what we're about to talk about. Because what I'm dealing with today, what I want to talk about is surviving your hour of testing. The hour of testing is similar to what I read about in the book of Job. Here is a man that has all the cattle, all the sheep, all the wealth, in great health and ten children. Satan then says to God, he's serving you for ulterior motives. If you take what he has, then he's going to curse you to your face. Let me tell you something about God versus, the, versus Satan. Ready? Satan can try to predict an outcome of something he does not know, but he does not have the power to create the outcome. Oh, I'm about to preach a message at my camp meeting. I'm going to give you one line from it. You ready? Satan, no, now Alpha and Omega is the first and last letter of the Greek alphabet. And Jesus said, I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the author, and the finisher. That's what it refers to. But let me just give you a good word. Are you ready? The adversary knows how to Alpha your problem, but he don't know how to Omega it. He doesn't know the end. The Bible says about Job in the book of James, you've seen the end of the Lord, how God is able to deliver the godly. He talks about a lot how God is able to deliver the godly and to preserve the unrighteous to the day of judgment. So therefore, what I want you to see in this and what I, what I don't want you to miss is that the hour of testing for Job was when all hell broke loose. 
All the animals are stolen. Lightning hits the sheep. Ten kids are killed with a whirlwind that brought the house and the roof down on them. Then he loses his complete health, sitting in ashes with boils breaking out on his skin. And he talks about even skin worms, which was actually a certain type of disease back then. The man has lost everything that there is to lose. This is called the hour of testing. Your hour of testing might have been somebody you love dying with COVID. Your hour of testing might be, because we have families in Cleveland, that all the family came down with it or now has it, everybody in the family. So it might be, that might be your hour of, your hour of testing may have been an accident that somehow damaged your nerves in your body or your neurological system. Your hour of testing could be the death of a child from a drug overdose. Your hour of testing, I could go through a list, maybe the loss of a job, and you can't figure out where the money's going to come from, and it's the worst thing that you have gone through. It may be a divorce after being married 25 years. So everybody in the building is going to have at some point an hour of testing. It'll be not just, not just common, not just seasonal, but it'll be something that you've got to be able to say, if I don't stand, I'm not going to make it through this. If I quit, I'm going to lose everything i got. So you've got to understand everybody here will have the hour. Now, it is my opinion that if you look at this verse, I'm about to go. Everything I have set up till now was the introduction. Now we get into the message. All right. So in this verse, I'm very intrigued by him talking about the hour of testing that tries every person who is on the earth. Now, some scholars suggest it's the tribulation period. But I would like to take this into a whole another dimension. There is only one event in past history that I can think of that affected everybody on the entire planet. Only one. Only one in 6,000 years. Now, we could always, always say Adam's sin in the Garden of Eden affected the world, but that was a, a couple, two individuals that sinned and sin being passed on. That's the ultimate problem. But outside of that, it's in Genesis 6 and 7. And that was that God said there's coming a flood that's going to cover the entire world. And there's only going to be eight people that's going to be able to survive this and make it through this, what is what was called, what, what scholars and, and people call the universal flood. Now, here's the thing about the flood. Only a few people, you, you better track with me here, and I want you to think about COVID, which has affected the entire world. It shut down cities in China and England and Australia and New Zealand and Canada and Latin America and America, all continents of the world except Greenland. You know why Greenland wasn't hardly affected? Because ain't nobody living up in Greenland but a bunch of animals. So it's a little bit different when you're, a, you're, you're an animal versus a human. But all the continents of the world were completely on lockdown. And watch this. It says in your Bible, you want to see some parallels of the flood of Noah and the COVID virus? You want to see some parallels? This is in your Bible. It, it says that on the second month and on the 17th day, the waters of the flood came. If you take the second month on the Jewish calendar, if we start the Jewish New Year when COVID began, right? If you take the second month, it would be because remember, the Jewish calendars are different every year because of, of the timing of the different things in the moon and whatever. Watch this. It would have started in October and November. So in other words, the flood started second month, 17th day. Let's use the Jewish calendar. October and November, if you'll remember, is when we started getting news of a virus breaking out of China. It had been there a little while, but they kept it quiet. Now, by, by, by October and November, we were hearing it hit in different different parts of the world. The flood is beginning. But if we use the Gregorian calendar of the second month and the 17th day, that is the month of February. Oh, what do I remember about February? President Trump announcing that a virus was here now. It was beginning to spread and they were going to have to deal with it. Wow. We use the Jewish calendar. We find COVID starts being known in the world. We use the Gregorian calendar and we find the same month, second month, February, that we would start hearing more reports and we start making it really public and all of a sudden this thing that we're hearing about becomes known and noted. Come on, help me somebody with what I'm about to say right here, here in the United States of America. Now here's what else is interesting. Do you know how long the flood waters were on the earth until Noah could come out of lockdown? Oh, did I just say lockdown? 
Yeah, he was in a boat, locked in a boat, and couldn't come out of that boat because of the flood that was covering the entire earth. And it was literally one year and two months before he was actually able to physically come out of that boat and begin what looked like normality. I would like to tell you, I've dated it, and when COVID started hitting the United States, we went through lockdowns, then a re-lockdown, then New York is under lockdown, then California goes back under it, and it was a year and two months before they start lifting the restrictions. Come on, somebody. Is anybody here in a parallel here of history that repeated itself? My Lord, help me now. Help me, help me, help me, help me. Now, we come out, you know, and look, I went to, and y'all forgive me because I know Oklahoma has got a good football team because my buddy Jalen Hurst was your quarterback from Alabama for a year. And I know Jalen prayed for him at the, you know, in Alabama and all that, prayed for him personally, so I'm not dropping names, but just wanting you to know. But we happened to be, my wife and I, and, and she converted me. I, I, I you know, I do, I do cheat every now and then and go to other sides, but uh, we're Alabama fans. So we go to the Alabama game last week. Now listen to me, 71,000 people in Mercedes-Benz Stadium where Alabama is playing Miami and I looked and there was nobody with a mask on 71,000 no there was no it was the craziest thing now I had one in my pocket and I said look mama didn't raise a dummy these people hawking coughing breathing and I'd sit there with mine on and go to go you know eat with mine not that I'm pro or against her. I'm just I'm I'm really neutral on all of this but I just said to myself man alive and then I, I look at every other college game in the South, and they're all the same way. These people hollering, screaming, spitting on each other. So my point is, my point is that you do see the parallel of how they came out of the ark, right? At the same time, a year and two months. So what my point is to see the parallel that people have come out of their, in their own head, their own mind, their lockdowns to go back out in public to be involved in public. Is anybody still tracking with me on this? Now, here's the part that's weird. Here's another part that's weird. So, they're supposed to be, and there are Lamba variant, and they got a variant called Moo. Now, that sounds Moo, Moo, Moo. No, it didn't come from a cow in Oklahoma. But Moo, that, that went right over your head. Somehow, it just went flipped right over top of your head. What they're doing is they're naming the variants with Greek letters. You have Delta. Remember the talk about the Delta? Where did Delta come from? Not Delta Airlines. The Delta, the capital D D Delta Greek letter looks like a triangle, right? And uh, they have a variant called Delta. Then they come and say, well, this one we found over in uh, Latin America that's jumping around that's called Lamba. Lamba is a Greek letter. Then the next one is Mu. Now, Mu is the latest. Now, let me, tell, let me tell you something. I do a thing, and if, you, uh, if you've never watched us do this, it is very intriguing because I do all of my studies basically from the Hebraic alphabet, the Hebraic letters, the uh, 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 um, gematria of, of, of things. And it's very interesting because when you're in a prophetic season, it works. I mean, it really is really weird. And some of you saw me do this on national television, but... During the 2016 election, it was uh, Donald Trump and Hillary, and I found out that, that the next president would be number 45. And I said, 45, if I go to the Hebrew alphabet, I wonder the numerical value of 45. And it was two letters. It was Mem Hey. Mem's value is 40. Hey is 5. Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hey. That's 45. And you know what's weird? When you say Ma in Hebrew, you're saying, What? So I preached in the field house in Williamson, West Virginia in the month of June. I preached in Houston, Texas the night before the election. I preached at Omega Center International one hour before we flipped on Fox News. And I said, ladies and gentlemen, based on the number 45, whoever gets elected today, the news media will be saying, what? How did this happen? Every what was funny is everywhere I preached it, people said, so you say Trump's going to get elected. And I said, I didn't say anybody. I, I'm just telling you what the numbers show. He said, nope. If Hillary got in, everybody's expecting that. If Trump got in, they'd be saying, what? What in the world happened here? And uh, if, you, if you watch the news, when they called the election within 48 hours, it was, what? 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 Oh, my God. What? 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 So this is the system that I use. Now, watch this. Mu in Greek, the letter is, ready, 40, 
in the alphabet because the Greek and Hebrew are the only two alphabets that have a number value. Watch this. 40 is the number of testing. So we have moved from the seasons of Noah. You tracking with me? Which is the one year. This is good preaching whether you're listening or not. Which is the one year and two months of the flood of Noah, which is the one year and two months of lockdown. Now the people have come out of that quite extensively. And, of course, it's, there's different reasons for that. And I'm not going to get into that. I'm not going to be controversial with that. But let me just say this, that this next variant, which is a more serious variant, is testing. Now, what did the Lord say? The hour of... I'm going to let it sink in. I'm preaching too fast for some of you to grab it. I'm going to let it sink in for just a minute there, okay? Now, please understand this, that this is not the only time that the world has seen a crisis. World War I, 1914 to 1918, lasted five years. 30 nations were involved, 20 million deaths, 21 million people wounded. World War II, 1939 to 1945, seven years, 30 nations involved. 100 million people participated in the war with 85 million casualties. The only time, and what we've been in lately has been compared to this, was in 1918, the Spanish influenza was a global pandemic that affected 500 million people. That's how many that were infected. It came in four different waves. Hello. Delta, okay, COVID-19, Delta, Lamba, Mu. Y'all tracking with me? See, historic parallels where cycles repeat themselves, all right? But what happened there, this is, now this is the crazy part. Because of the waves that would hit this country, then jump over to that country, one-third of the world's population died during the Spanish influenza. And when you read, and we're not there, and I don't believe we're in the book of Revelation yet as far as the prophetic part of the breaking of the seals. And I have friends, that, good friends that disagree with me on that, but there's reasons I believe that, and I won't go into detail for that. But I do believe, though, that we're seeing the exact parallels of what we have seen in the past take place. I believe Matthew 24, where it talks about pestilences in different places, this is a part of what we're seeing happen here. And so the, the thing that I want to show you and I want to my goodness help me here Jesus I want to take you back for just a moment to because I'm going somewhere with this in a moment to the flood of Noah now in the flood of Noah water came from two different directions we read it rained 40 days and 40 nights however you've got to go back to Genesis 6 and read where or, uh, 6 and 7 and it says watch this and the fountains of the deep were opened now, there is a word used in Genesis, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Darkness was on the face of the deep. Genesis chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 3, you'll see it there. Deep is normally the word to home, to home, to home. And to home is the underground abyss. Under the earth, crust, mantle, and core, you've got three levels. When you get under the crust, there's something called the moho revistic discontinuity. I'm not trying to give you a science lesson here. But there are aquifers, as you know, in Oklahoma, you've got oil underground, right, and pockets of oil. Well, there's aquifers that are the same way that there is water. Some of it actually in Israel goes back to the time of creation, according to the scientists. But other times it's drainage where it forms the aquifer or rain can form the aquifer or snow can form it. But it's underneath the ground. In the time of Noah, which is over a little bit over 1,000, uh, right around, let's say, 1,600 years after the creation of Adam, here comes a flood. How does it come? From the fountains of the deep opening and from rain for 40 days nonstop coming from the sky. So water is seen from two directions, from the earth moving from out of the earth, right out from underneath the earth, rain coming from above. Let me tell you what this represents. And I, the reason I'm on Noah so heavy is the Bible says as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be at the time of the coming of the Son of Man. And many times in the stories of Noah, we talk about what Jesus said in Matthew 24, eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage before they entered the ark. And that's the signs that we go with. you got to go back to these stories and you're going to find there's, there's, there's eight numbers, eight 
great numbers in the story of Noah that are all prophetic. Yet seven days, I'll cause it to rain. And it rains for 40 days and 40 nights. And 150 days. I mean, these numbers are all prophetic. And you see some of them repeating in prophecy, literally, in the book of Revelation. But watch this. In the time of Noah, the time of the flood of Noah, water from below, water from, 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 beneath, from beneath and above. Here's what this represents. Jesus said in Luke, uh, Luke's gospel, he said that in the last days, there'd be all these different signs, and he said there would be signs in the sun, the moon, the stars upon the earth, distress of nation with perplexity. That phrase is translated in another translation, there will be such perplexity among the nations they will not know a way out. Then men's hearts began to fail them for fear of looking after the things coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. He then mentions in Luke's gospel that there would be signs in the sun, moon, and stars, and the sea and the waves would be roaring. One translation says the sea and the waves heaving beyond their boundaries. We would say today a tsunami. Why, why would I say that that is a reference that Jesus is giving us a prophetic reference to tsunamis? Because if you look at the word roaring in Greek, it comes from a word that is, means echo. It's the word that we use for echo. It's another Greek word for sound, but it's echo there. Talk to, it, talk to people who survived a tsunami who were on their balcony or somehow in a beach and they jumped up in a tree. They will tell you all that before the wave hit the shore, there was a strange roaring from the water. There was an echo from out in the ocean. They all heard it. And that's how some of them knew, get out of here, get up on higher ground. Something big's about to happen. So that phrase in Luke's gospel that Jesus used of sea and waves roaring, what would that allude to in the days of Noah? The water of the fountains of the deep underneath the ground cracking. Really and truly what happened is in the days of Noah, there were massive earthquakes. The whole earth shook because the Bible said, whose voice, speaking of God in Hebrews, once shook the earth, but now has promised it will shake for a second time. So the shaking in that day was not just Mount Sinai, that's the reference there, but it was the shaking in the flood. So what happened was the plates of the ocean gave way, the waves came in, and I mean everything starts getting washed out on the, on the cities, the towns, and the communities just by tsunamis. And then at the same time, while the fountains are opening up and water's gushing from the ground, rain is coming. This is how in 40 days it went to, according to the Bible, two feet above the top of the highest mountain on earth. Someone says that's impossible. No, it's not. Not when you have that amount of rain, not when you have the tsunamis or the aquifers busting out from underneath. Somebody stay with me because we're about to go somewhere. Now, the entire world is affected, and Noah is locked in one year and two months. Finally, the earth gets dry. Stay with me because here we go. And then after the, the waters dried up, after Noah exited the ark, they went into, listen to my word, a global reset. Now, what has the talk been? You, has anybody watch my YouTube channel? Oh, thank you. Everybody subscribe to that. I'm trying to get a million viewers. If I get a million viewers, YouTube gives me a personal person that I can talk on the phone and complain if they try to take me off. So... So get me, get me, everybody just go subscribe if you never watch me. Just get me up to a million so I can get some, some help out in here, okay? And I do have to use wisdom, okay? So some of you that have followed me on that know, and if you ever watch, you'll get more information there than the regular news. There is a global economic reset. Okay, do you want me to go there for five minutes? Can we go on a rabbit trail or not? Older people in the United States, especially those whose parents or grandparents went through the Great Depression, do not trust the system. Can I just say it this way? I'm from the mountains of Kentucky, southwestern Virginia, and the hillbillies of West Virginia. We trust cash only. Wow. <laughs> 
and one and one of the reasons in the mountains they don't they trust cash only is because they don't have no internet access. They can't but get, they can't get nothing else. You know, I mean, you go to a local bank, it's computer ain't working today, honey. You know, all the women in West Virginia call you honey, honey. It's not working today. I don't know. You may come back tomorrow. So I'm telling you, am I telling the truth, Charlie? We've gone into the mountains up there. We can't even get phone service. We can't get the internet. If your car breaks down, you 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 hope that oh uh, Bobo comes by in his pickup truck and takes you somewhere and picks you up and gets your tire, you know, your tire fixed. I'm really serious. You think I'm joking. I'm really not joking when I tell you this. My point is that the elderly people, like my mom was one of those, did not want to do banking on the internet because of trusting someone stealing her social security number. And it happens. You know what happens. It happens that hackers get into these big companies all the time. Now, what we do, and I'm not making, this is not a, uh, a, a security secret, but my computer that handles all income has no access to the internet. And when my banks said to me, uh, we would like for you to do online banking, I told my secretary, it's hard checks. It's it's checks, and it's hardcore old school. And if you tell them that if they make me go to banking that it has to go on the Internet, I'll pull all my money out of the bank and find me one that won't. Well, they worked with me from that moment on. That's a little bit more work for them at times. But we just, we just made it to where a hacker could not go online and get into our system because that mainframe will not, under any condition, only go to, right, Charlie, only go to one system. And then we've got four people that are tech people that watch everything that's going on in our ministry so we're very blessed to have good good workers not saying something can't happen i'm not trying to say that because things are crazy now but so the point i'm making is what i'm about to make the idea and i know this from a lot of different sources but the idea is this we want to make it we're talking here in the united states we want to make it to where everybody has a digital wallet which means that your money gets placed in the digital wallet. And then instead of using Bitcoin or some of these other uh, things that you hear about, because Bitcoin is used, it's the currency that hackers want when they hack into a system. So I know for a fact that the Senate and the House right now is wanting to try to do away with some of this or limiting the usage of it because they want to come up with Fedcoin. Now, FedCoin sounds like a great idea, right? The problem with FedCoin is they will know every time you spend, every time you get money, and they can't track the cash as much as they can electronic systems. So everybody gets your digital wallet. Now, my son don't even carry cash. This is kind of spooky to me. He's 32 years of age, and he pays on his phone. Now, look, I'm, t I'm just telling you, I, 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 maybe I'm way too old school, but when you can look at a box and call Siri, and she can tell you information. I don't want that box hanging around my house. No, not a box that talks back to me. Okay, you might like it. It might work good for you, but no, a talking box, you know, and, and uh, his wife was singing on the name of Jesus. Now, am I telling a true story? She's singing on the, about the name and the blood of Jesus, and a voice came over that box and said, F the blood of Jesus, right? She went, what? Where did that come from? And it comes out of this box. So the problem you have is the older generation is less trusting. So, and let me tell you, and let me tell you how the system is played. And I'm not trying to be, i got to be careful sharing this because, you know, you talk stuff like this and people that think you're political, they think you're getting off for this, and that's not what I'm here for. I'm an informer for you. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a person that gives you truth, information from the Word of God and things that we know. But... A group of people from Georgia, um, where, Ch where does Chant Pastor? Chickamauga, Georgia. Business people, very good people, Christian people, went to the rally on January the 6th in Washington. There were, there were a crowd of people there, okay. They did not go to the Capitol. They did not participate in anything bad. When they came back to Georgia... Someone in Washington had their bank shut off their accounts. They had to get lawyers to fight to get their own personal bank accounts opened again. And I could tell you stories, and I'm not going to take the time, but I could tell you stories. So my point is that in a global reset, now I'm going to give you the brief of it. You ready? Here we go. You print money trillions of dollars, trillions. You give it away, 
you keep the presses going until finally everything devalues what's in your pocket. Your dollar that's worth 50 cents now becomes worth 5 cents. What happens at that point is it costs you more to purchase what you were purchasing. What cost you a dollar now costs four. What costs four now costs ten. Anybody finding that out lately? Okay. Now, so what happens eventually is you collapse the system or you go to extreme deflation, inflation. I'm not going to talk about all this. It's too detailed. Or hyperinflation, which is my biggest concern, which is what happened in the Weimar Republic in Germany. And so what happened in Germany was people wanted their paychecks every day. You had to cut them out a check and get it to the bank and try to buy what you were going to buy because it came to the point in Weimar Republic where it took a wheelbarrow full of German marks to buy a loaf of bread. And finally, people in Germany were saying, just use it for toilet paper because that's the value of it. So what's happening right now, and only, I'm going to be careful saying this, but only electing the right kind of people who are pro-American, who want to help the American people. That's, that's the only way to stop this, whether it's Oklahoma, whether it's your county, whether it's D.C. Because if they are globalists, they are wanting a reset. This has been planned by the globalists for you. This is nothing new. But what happens is eventually then is then you go to a digital currency, and here's the danger, that's trackable. So if they decide that you did something on social media that did not agree with the government, guess what happens to your bank account? It gets frozen. Now, you know, you think, look, I'm not making this up. I didn't go to some Internet source to get this. I got people way up on the inside. Some of you would scare you if you knew some of the people I knew. It scares me with some of the people I know. I had an Arab friend one time, and he drove around Jimmy Carter, Madeleine Albright, world leaders, because he owned a bulletproof uh, car, several of them, right? So he's in there, and they're talking about this, and they're talking about that. And he says to me one day, Brother Perry, he said, you know that all these peace things have been planned for years. He said, I said, really? need to get He said, the embassy, now this, look, this is 10 years ago. He said, we went by a building on Ramad Hotel in Jerusalem. He said, look at this. This will be the U.S. embassy. They already had the embassy picked out. It was already picked out. Just no president had the guts to do it. Except one, right? But no, they didn't have the guts to do it. They were afraid of political fallback. So he shows me the embassy, and it is today the U.S. embassy. So he says to me, would you like for me to get you the copies of the secret treaties? No! <laughs> oh, my God, are you kidding me? Brother, brother. My cousin is the he is with the king of Arabia. My other brother, he is in Iraq. My cousin is in Kuwait. My brother, we can get you anything you want. We Arabs are not under the same controls as the Jews and Americans. I said, you ain't giving me nothing. I'm not going to take an envelope to Tel Aviv and be asking, am I carrying something back? No. Did I not tell him that, Charlie? No, 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 no. He said, I don't even want to know what your conversations are because if I'm ever asked, did somebody give you a conversation? I don't even want to know what they said in the limousine. He said, I did ask Jimmy Carter one time, do you know Perry Stone? I said, oh, that's great. <laughs> he kept kept the picture of my family. I'm, I'm, I'm on a rabbit trail, but he kept the picture. This is, a, this is an Arab driver, a very wealthy family from Jerusalem, but he kept my picture on his uh, visor, right? And so sometimes when the sun was shining, people would get in, they'd pull the, he pulled the visor down. I said, Yosef, why do you have the, my family picture? He said, because you're my brother. Oh my God, you're my brother, my favorite preacher in the world. I said, well, thank you for that. He said, but I tell you something else, brother. You're very good for business. Did he not say this? I said, what do you mean? He said, oh, I have people. I pick them up from a hotel, take them to the Western Wall, from the Western Wall to a restaurant, from a restaurant to the Mount of Olives. He said, then they pull the visor down. They see your picture. They say, oh, it's just like Perry Stone. I say, this is Perry Stone, one of my best friends. They said, you know Perry Stone? Oh, Perry, yes. I, and he did. And I drive the bus for him. Well, you know what? We're going to hire you for the whole week to drive us around. All because That happened. That happened. Anyway, I better I, let me get back on this. 
Now, now, now let, me, let me get into this part. So, the idea is reset. They reset after the flood. This is what you've got to understand. Some of these things we can delay, right? If we stand up, we can delay. Some of the things we can stop. Other things are so prophetically set by Scripture that the time will come, they will happen. Like, we're not going to be able to stop the tribulation. We're not going to be able to stop the rise of the actual Antichrist. We cannot stop the rise of the Ten Kings. When that comes, that's what's called a sure word of prophecy. Okay? However, judgment can be delayed. Read the story of Nineveh, right? Pros destruction to economies can be shifted by right people. So that's my point. There's things we can't change, but the things... All right, now watch this very carefully. Ooh, this gets eerie right here. After the flood, Shem, Ham, and Japheth and their wives repopulated the earth. One group took Africa. One group took what we would call the Middle East. One group, and when I say took, let me rephrase that, settled in that area and repopulated. And the other took Europe. So you had Europe, the Middle East, and you had Africa. And that's where civilization began to repopulate. Then you come to a time, and this is important, in Genesis, you go from Genesis chapter 9, you start seeing the nations come in, right? Then you go to 11, and it says, And men traveled from the east to the plains of Shinar and built a tower in the desert called the Tower of Babel. Now, here's where it gets interesting. So flood of Noah, a few years later, you come to the tower. Why is the tower story important? It is the first record of the world's first global government. You see the parallels of what we're talking about? So uh, Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, the thing which have, has been is that which shall be. That's the principle I'm working on here. So history repeats itself. So after the flood, let me just break it down this way. After the COVID crisis, you're going to eventually have to have a reset. And they're doing it now in Europe. They're trying to do it at least in the United States. So in the reset, what does it eventually lead to? The Antichrist and his kingdom represented in Revelation 17, 18 as Mystery Babylon. Everybody, who's tracking with me? Raise your hand. Are y'all keeping up with I want to make sure, I don't, you're very smart people. I want to make sure you're getting, I don't want to, I don't want to get over top of your head. Now, in Babel, watch this, there's Nimrod, whom Josephus says was a rebel against God. So Nimrod says, we're going to have one language, One language, one religion, and the global religion, by the way, is not Christianity, just so you'll know. Not the Christianity we know, we love. So we're going to have one world religion, we're going to have one world government, we're going to have a headquarters. Now here's one that I've got to give you, and then I'm going to get on the rest of this message. It says that he decided to build his entire kingdom with bricks. God's kingdom is a kingdom of stone. Not Perry Stone, stone. <laughs> Let me tell you the difference between a brick and a stone, okay? Now, how do I know the Lord is our rock and our salvation? Don't give me the, all the scriptures, you know. Upon this rock, I'll build my church. No, God is not into bricks. God is into stones. Because stones are different colors, different shapes, and different sizes. And each is not like the other. No two stones from the ground, no two are alike, just like your fingerprints. So God says we're individuals, different colors, different races, different ways of thinking, but we are a kingdom of stone. What is a brick? A brick is something that is mass made. It looks alike. They all look alike. They all are the same size. And they all have no special feature about them. That is communism. Now, if you will study communism, communism is commonism or communityism, meaning you all do one job, you were all paid the same amount. Ask anybody that came from Russia, I got Russian friends. You wore the same clothes, women wore the same dresses, men wore the same hats and the same coats because everybody had to be equal 
Really what's odd is except the leaders who could drive what they want, live how they want, eat what they want, get their caviar while their poor people suffer. And that's what happens. The elite, the elite protect themselves and get whatever they want. And you, the common people, you have to pay the price. So a brick is built by Babel. It was built, ready for this? It says they made brick with slime. You ever heard of a slime ball? Slime. Tarry substance. Sticky substance. So the what will be built through the new world order will not be stones. It'll be bricks. It'll be people that have to think alike, march to the system, obey orders from the top, and if you don't, you end up like Daniel in a lion's den. What these nuts don't realize is God likes fiery furnaces and lion's dens. Hey, hey! God don't mind showing up. So let's go back. Let's go back to this real quick. So under the COVID crisis, entire cities were shut down, businesses closed, churches were allowed. You know, can I go back to ten people in a church? Did it ever? Did it ever kind of? Did you ever figure out the 10, why the 10 was significant? Inclu did you, you, do, you do know that, right? They passed a ruling in most states that said, okay, for, for a month in Tennessee, it was, you can only let 10 people in. Uh, so my daughter knew I was a little depressed about that, so she went and got all the puppets in the children's church. She got 20 puppets, sat them in the sheets, chairs while I was preaching with signs. The puppets were just puppets. Preach on, preacher. Amen, brother. She even had a puppet laying on the floor, slain in the spirit right there while I was preaching. <laughs> I wish I could find that video. That was the funny. And, and then she comes out with a dog's head like she's praising God, a puppet dog's head. And I'm telling you, she lifted my spirits up when I saw, when I saw that taking place. Okay. Why 10? Days of Lot, days of Noah. These are the two days that Jesus compared to, right? How many did Abraham intercede for that said, if we can find that many, we won't destroy the place? 10. They didn't say 20, they didn't say 15, they didn't say 7, they said 10. And to me, even though they chose 10, I referred it back to that story of Abraham interceding for Lot. And if they'd have found 10, did you know Sodom would have still existed? Did you know the fire would have never come? And I took that to mean, God, this is bad, but we're not going to be destroyed by this in Jesus' name. There's 10 people, and if you can find 10, you can save the city. Hey, somebody ought to hear what I'm saying. These are, these are prophetic, these, these, are, these are what I call prophetic parallels. Now it says this, there's an hour of testing coming upon the whole earth. In the New Testament, it says in John's gospel that Jesus' hour had not yet come. They went to stone him, his hour had not yet come. They went to push him off a cliff. In Luke's gospel, his hour had not yet come. However, he made the statement in John, mine hour is come. And the moment he said his hour is come, that is when his enemies were permitted. Hedge comes down to take him. Nebuchadnezzar had a 12-month uh, month warning by a, a dream that he had that Daniel gave the interpretation that he was going to have a complete nervous breakdown. 12 months to the very day the hour came. And the same day and the same hour, Nebuchadnezzar's mind snapped. Belshazzar is at a party. He's another king of Babylon. And within the hour, the same hour, a finger of a man's hand appeared to write on the wall. In Revelation 17, 18, Mystery Babylon is destroyed in one hour. So the hour of testing, if you look at these examples, is something that happens, and it happens very quick. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to last an hour. It means it is an extended season of which extreme tests take place. Now, I would ask you this question. I'm almost done with the message. Give me a few more things here. The reason for the testing, because I've, I've, I've asked myself this. Is this just an end time sign? Is it a Matthew 24 sign? Is it just a weird event that the whole world has to go through? Is it a part of, it's not the only fulfillment, but is it a part of the fulfillment of this Revelation 12 chapter? And then what's the real reason for it. And I'm going to give you what I think. First of all, in Daniel 7.25, it talks about the Antichrist spirit, and it says this, he shall wear out the saints 
of the Most High God. I looked up the word wear out. That part of Scripture is written in Aramaic and not Hebrew. Do you know what it means? It means to mentally wear down. I thought it meant to physically tire, but it means no, that he will mentally wear you down. He will just keep hitting and pressing and beating on you till he wears you down. So then I started looking at this idea of wearing down. Satan had strength until he revealed his covenant, and then after he revealed the secret of his Nazarite vow, he lost his strength. When you lose strength, you will become discouraged. If you are a giver and you lose your job and you can't give, then there is an attack against the strength and your strength was being a giver. I mean, I could go on through all these different scriptures talking about the attack is on the strength. Now, let me talk to you now about this virus that we've all been dealing with. My wife and I both have had COVID. In November, uh, in, uh, well, I was, um, this part of this probably I shouldn't tell, but back in March before uh, now, this is, this is not this March. We're talking about the previous March. When all this broke, I had a doctor who happens to be the doctor of a president, not President Trump, but another president that I won't name. And he calls me from Texas, and he, I may mean, I mean, just gave it away right there. Uh, <laughs> trying to be sly and just gave it away right there. But he said, he's a, he's a friend of our ministry, and he said, now, Perry, I have a, a hydro, I, I can never can't pronounce it, a hydroxychloroquine or whatever you call it. And he said, I'm, I'm having success in treating people with this. I'd like to send 50 pills to you. And he said, then if you get sick, get a Z-Pack, call me, I'll get you a Z-Pack. We'll send it in. Well, of course, that's all been stopped now in case you didn't know it. But uh, in November, my temperature went from one, no, from 99 to 106 in five hours. So I had had a, we went up and got a test when it started going up. And of course, the lady tested me and she said, well, you got a real problem. She said, you have a influenza A, which is the normal flu and COVID at the same time. Oh, hallelujah. Well, I didn't feel, I mean, outside of my fever, I didn't feel bad. I wasn't losing my taste. Oh, God, let, you know, put, put me asleep for a month if I lose my taste and can't taste food. You understand what I'm saying? That's the curse. That is, that's like having an itch that you just can't get rid of. That is the worst. That would be, to me, that would be the worst thing in the world. So I'm, my, so the doctor, Pam, calls down in Texas. He says, you better tell him he's got diabetes. He, he's, he's not a great candidate for this. And I said, you tell Doc. Get me the Z pack. Just let's let's get it. Let's go to the clinic because we're very well known in town in the hospitals, and God's given us many friends. And I, I said, just get it and give me give me forty eight hours. That's all I'm asking. If I ain't better, I'll go somewhere. And oddly enough, thanks the Lord, within forty eight hours, the temperature was back to about ninety eight to ninety nine. Uh, but here's the point I want to make. So then my wife, I mean, she's around all kinds of people. I don't know what the deal was. She took a lot of the vitamins and things they were suggesting. But we were around a lot of people, and she just never could catch it, never did catch it. She found out somebody had it. Well, his wife, hallelujah, Mona Ellis, got a real bad case of it. Her and Pam were in the car together. So Pam tells me, she said, I'm not feeling good. Well, she gets tested. Well, she's got it. Well, her oxygen started dropping, so she ended up in an emergency room and ended up in a hospital for five days. Now, thankfully, I never had to go, but she did. Now, I'm going to go, I'm going to give you two, mm, but stay with me. I'm going to give you two things right here. Two things I learned. Number one, I started realizing that even though I recovered, now this, this happened to me. It took me six months to get my full strength back because I would be okay. Charlie knows this. And I said, Charlie, I'm laying down. I have a couch and an apartment upstairs in my office, kind of an apartment. And at two o'clock every single day, all my energy left. And I didn't sleep. I wasn't sleepy. I laid down flat or on my stomach and give me one hour and I'm able to get back up. And I thought, well, this is weird. So I started checking with some of my dear friends in the medical field. They said, Bear Perry, that's a side effect and it can last a couple weeks, a couple months. And it was June or July until uh, this year until I really got back where I don't have that problem. All right. Well, uh, most people, now, now what, what did I just tell you a moment ago? I told you a moment ago that the, the Antichrist does what? Wears out the saints of the Most High. So this, whatever we want to call it, whatever we want to take, talk about side effects, there's one thing that is common with everybody I've talked to. Strength leaves them. Anybody had it already, had to deal with it, right? Am I telling the truth? There's this, they're just like, why am I so tired? Why am I so weak? So I see this attack against our strength. It's a virus, yes. It's something we all battle, yes. 
but it's an attack. It attacks the strength. Now, I'm, I'm going somewhere with this to so stay with me. So when I talked about strength, it, the, the thought hit me that the Bible says this, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And so when you are in such a physical battle, what's the first thing you feel leave? Talk to me, somebody. Your joy. You know, it's not like, oh, I'm sick. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Somebody, okay, honey, you get into that arm. I'll get, you get into that arm, and you just walk, walk me around the house for the glory of God. I'm feeling terrible, but I'm going to keep the joy. You don't feel like you're laying in the bed. Oh, God. Oh, God. What's happening to me? This, this has got to be the tribulation. Perry Stone was wrong. Perry Stone was wrong. Ain't no rapture. It's tribulation. You know what I'm saying? I mean, really, you, I'm telling you, you feel lousy. And that's why the Bible said in James 5, when you're sick, what do you do? You call the elders. Do you know why you call the elders? Because you don't feel like praying for yourself. It's like, give me some prayer people over here. Somebody bring some oil. I mean, don't just touch, don't do me that little Pentecostal cross on the head or the, the Catholic priest cross on the head. Don't do that. Pour that oil on my head. Pour it down my mouth, up my nose, in my eyes. Somebody help me pray. Get rid, get rid of this, whatever this crazy thing is happening. All right, now, the second, the second thing I want to tell you, first of all, all of this is an attack against our strength because the joy of the Lord is our strength, and we can do more in joy than we can when we don't have it. Number two, it is a testing of patience. Revel now, this, these are messages to the churches. I know your labor and your patience, Revelation 2, 2. You have patience, Revelation 2, 3. Revelation 2, 19. I know your charity, service, and faith, Revelation 3, 10. You've kept the word of my patience, Revelation 13, 10, and 14, 2. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Patience means, quote, the, the capacity to accept or tolerate delay, trouble, or affliction without anger or getting upset, remaining calm through, watch this, long, difficult problems. Now, it is very clear in the Bible, if you'll read the Gospels and Revelation, that the one thing everybody has to have in the last days is faith and patience. And we ain't got either. Because <laughs> we'll pray a prayer. I can't understand why God didn't do it. I prayed all night long. I didn't do it. I mean, I'm just upset. I'm quitting, right? Patience. And patience is the ability to endure but when you're, when you're trying to endure and you're trying to be patient and you're in the middle of, let's say, a COVID battle or your family is, and it's not just COVID, it's other things going on, you know that. What's the best way to react? Well, I'm going to tell you, my wife gave the church. We, we, have, we don't have a church. We have Ramp Cleveland, which is like a fellowship. She gave them the best advice I ever heard. So let me tell you her story. And, and I'm almost done. Uh, she gets up. She had gotten up early that morning, and, you know, she'd had some symptoms and so on, and she was, uh, she'd was, she gone to a clinic, got some treatment, was doing good, and then all of a sudden she got one of those little meters you can buy at the store. Everybody can buy one of these, and it checks your oxygen. And she said, Perry, something is not right with me. And I said, well, get your, get your meter. And her oxygen was 82. And everybody knows at this point the danger of oxygen has to do the brain cells. That's to be, or, and, the, and the organs of the body. It says the organs of the body, it can affect them. But the biggest thing for older people, uh, because my mama basically went to a hospital, and they, they put her on a vent, and she was actually doing great, and she had a heart attack. And it wasn't because of uh, anything she took or anything like that. We don't believe it. Just her heart gave way. We, she, honestly, we found out later she had heart trouble, and she never told nobody. So that's an Italian stubborn mom for you. She was stubborn. Anyway, she anyway she did pass away a few weeks ago. So uh, Pam said, I'm, I, "So I said, baby, uh, we're gonna call an ambulance." So we called an ambulance, and I said, "Get her to a room." And we're thankful that we have a hospital in town that so many people know our ministry. They watch us on TV. When Pam Stone came in, and I'm not saying this is good or bad, but I mean immediately they wanted to get her a room and try to find out what was wrong because we have people from our church that are part of that. We have people that are from other churches, and they love Pam. And she got up there, and you know, the hardest thing, if you have to ever go through this, is not being able to go in the hospital. I was going to disguise myself as an EM, uh, emergency man and walk in <laughs> with a mask on. I mean, you know, I mean, this, it really is, it is, that is the most frustrating. You can't see, you can't go up there and talk, and you know, that kind of thing. So uh, she was able occasionally to call. So they never put her on a vent, but they gave her a lot of oxygen. They gave her some treatments. But let me just say this. 
So she said to me when she got better, she's, she's there about five days. Uh, she said, I'm going to tell you what you fight, fear. And I had a doctor from Huntington, West Virginia. I was in Huntington, which is a great medical town, that said two things hurt the immune system. Anger, according to research, re- like if you get real mad, shuts the immune system down eight hours. Now, here's the second one. I did not know this. Extreme fear. This doctor said we believe that extreme fear can affect the immune system by dropping it 30 to 40 percent, meaning that if you do get this virus and fear hits, you're hindering your immune system with the fear. So my wife says to me, oh, fear, let me tell you about fear. She says, the first day I'm laying there, and we had three Church of God preachers, including leaders who die with it in their 50s, and I hear this voice say, who are you to live with, get better? Who do you think you are getting better? Three people died that were men of God. You're no, you're no more special than them, or you might die with this. Okay, and she said immediately, I said, I cannot live with this fear. So watch this. She would not turn the TV on. She would not watch the news talking about this virus. She wouldn't talk, listen to any statistics. She would listen, of course, to what the nurses said. But she contacted a girl and she texted. She said, get me downloads to my phone of all gospel music worship you got. This is, now, this is pretty cool. So she put it on her. Now, she's in a room eventually by herself. So she, can, she can do this. She would put it on speaker or either little earphones. And my wife said, 12 hours a day probably on an average. Sometimes I'd sleep a little bit. Sometimes I'd wake up, they'd wake me up. But 12 hours a day, all that came in my ear was worship. Now, this, this might help someone. The reason I'm sharing this, this could help you. And she said, I would not listen to anything on the news. I would not turn the TV on. I didn't want to hear anything they had to say. And she said, every time a fear would come or a thought would come, I'd just turn that music up in, in my mind or in my heart, or it's sometimes when I'd sing along with it. So five days later, of course, she's doing very, very well right now, doing real good. We both have been tested for the antibiotics. We both have them. Thank God for that. But she taught me something. She said, you have to exercise patience with this. You have to fight the fear. She said, I'm telling you, Perry, if I hadn't fought the fear, it would have killed me. It would have killed me. And so in this, in this time frame of what we're talking about here, I want to read a verse about Job because Job went through an hour of testing. And here's the verse, James 5, 10, 11. Is this helping anybody today? Yeah. I want to help you. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. The Bible said, he that can endure to the end will be saved. And that word endure means to bear up under a weight. You've heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Now watch the end. Samson slays more enemies at the end of his life than his entire life. Ruth, it says, uh, Naomi says, I have been shown more kindness in my latter years than all of my years. In Job, it says this, your latter end shall be greater than your beginning. Now, I'm going to claim this for you. We're going to have an altar call here in a minute. But I'm going to claim this for you because I'm going to tell you a story very quickly. I'm going to be very vague. It would take too long for one thing. And there's, uh, there's so many details that, it, that uh, we'd be all over the board. It wouldn't, it wouldn't matter. Um, everybody has to go through an hour of testing. Uh, I had lived my life for years going nonstop. Uh, There were times when I wrote the commentary for my Bible, the Old Testament, New Testament. Some of you have that. It's a total of a million word commentary. You know how long it takes to write a million words? Research, not just sit down and type it. Seven years to write it. In those seven years of writing the commentary for the Bible, I was under contract to write six, seven books. In the, in, under the contract of writing seven books at the same time, I was doing 150 new messages a year for conferences with the PowerPoint, which was research. Then I was doing 30 to 40 messages a year to preach in Israel that were different from all the other messages that I preached. And then I was hosting Thursday prayer from Omega Center International, Tuesday night service at Omega Center, flying out uh, 
on Friday preaching six to seven times, sometimes in some of the bigger churches, they have three, four services on Sunday, eight times, getting back and being the first person at the office. And I did this for four years. The Bible was seven years. Until I felt every, all of my energy leave and found myself laying on the floor with a Bible in a fetal position and couldn't get up. And I made myself, I literally would force myself to get up and sit at a desk and just almost just pass out right there. During that time, and I'm going to just say it in one phrase, the enemy tried to take advantage of, of me and the ministry with some people that were not what they should be. And when that happened, it created a, just a, uh, just a, uh, I can't even explain. And uh, I had to take time and I said, God, I just, I don't know if I can physically, physically even preach. Like, I, I mean, the thought of preaching would just wear me out. The thought of getting up just, just, I was like, oh God, oh God, I'm so, I can't do it. I can't do it. And it was about a year where, where of readjustment and, you know, you have the COVID thing too, that don't help. And all this is going on, and it's about a year or so. So i got to tell you what happened. This, this, this to me, if you knew the whole thing of what I'm about to tell you what God's done, it'd blow your mind. So after coming through this on April the 30th of this past year, uh, honestly, I don't remember where I was. I think I was sitting at my desk, and I felt the Spirit of God come on me. And I know when the Lord's about to speak. And he said this to me. And now this is for some of you. Some of you need to remember this, and you just need to lay hold of it too. He said to me, he said, I'm going to tell you what happened to you. And I stopped and said, ooh. And I closed my eyes, and the Lord begins to speak, and he says to me, he said, you have gone through a Job hour of testing. Because the enemy came to my throne and said, I want Perry Stone, and I can make him quit. And I told him, no, you won't. I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost told the Spirit of God, I'm telling you, and I'm just, I'm crying, I'm shaking, because I'm really, I know, look, one thing about this boy, I know, I know when God speaks, I know. And I said, oh, Lord, that's, that's it, that's it. And he says to me, starting today, as I did with Job, because you would not quit, you would not give up, and you kept on standing, I'm going to give you back double with everything. That's what he told me, Double. Now, that's in Job chapter 42. But he said this, read where it says, and when Job paid, prayed for his friends, and those friends were actually in Job four people that didn't even say the right thing about him or about God and made all kinds of blah, blah, blah. He said, you pray for them, and I'll turn you captive. So I sat down, I started releasing things. I started releasing, uh, I released people from 45 years ago that I didn't even, I forgot about, you know. I'm doing everything I know, and I'm telling you, I have a list, and it might be in this Bible. Let me see. Let me just see because I had it in one of my Bibles. No, maybe it's not in this one. But I had a list that's starting the next day. Now, I want you to listen to me. Everything in my life doubled. Buildings doubled. Houses doubled. Vehicles doubled. Income doubled. Everything doubled. And we now in, are in the midst, I'm not going to tell you about it, but we are now in the midst of the next four months of the ministry received, and it's not money, by the way, so don't think it's a check or money, but we're about to get the biggest blessing for the future of what we're about to do that I do not know of any ministry in America that's going to have what we have. It's, it's that bizarre. And we shake our heads. Charlie and I sometimes look, and we'll shake our heads and say, this is getting crazy. This is just insane. And we don't know. It's almost like we don't know what God's about to do next. And now I'm afraid of the blessing. <laughs> no, I'm really serious. It's like, God, this, wait a minute, Lord. Oh, what, are you, really, what are you doing? He said, I told you if you'll stand, I'll give you double. Now, that's a word for you. Why would you want to quit when we're this close to heaven? Huh? Why would you want to quit? Why would you why, why would you want to get angry? At, this is for somebody here. Angry at God because he took someone and allowed someone to go with this virus and you prayed for him to live. I had an 85-year-old mama that could have lived to be a hundred. 
Okay, seriously, she was, look, she broke her ankle, she broke her wrist, she had a hip replacement, and she had her teeth pulled, and was still coming to work every day, 85 years of age. I'm telling you, she's full-blooded. I, I don't know what's in the Italian blood. It's weird, whatever it is. These people just live on. I mean, they're like Methuselah. They just don't go nowhere. But see, I also knew she, she'd suffered a lot. How can I be angry? Yeah, the grandbaby's missing. My sister's got two little grandbabies is upset like crazy. I said, but how can I be upset knowing what she went through and knowing life got tough and now she don't have to deal with none of it? Are you kidding me? And I'm going to get upset at God for taking her to a city with streets of gold? Whoever this is for today that has been upset I'm, I'm, I'm speaking by a word of knowledge, by the gifts of the Spirit right now, who's been upset. Don't let yourself go there because a reunion's coming. A reunion's coming. I don't know how much time we got left. It could be months. It could be a couple of years. It could be a decade. I don't know. But I do know this. I'm going to do everything I can while I can with what I got. <laughs> Amen. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping and praying that when I exit this body, the first words I hear will be somebody behind me saying, well done. I want you to bow your heads all over the place. I'm going to start praying here for just a moment. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I thank you for the opportunity of, of this Sunday morning ministry. And I thank you for the, what I believe that I've shared what the, what the people need. I believe I've shared for someone who really needs encouragement, that I ask you to touch them in the name of the Lord. Let me, let me keep, have you have, keep your head bowed and your eye closed. Now, the only reason we do that is out of respect for people that may be a little bit shy or they're new and sometimes they're apprehensive about raising their hands. I don't, I don't call people out or say you in the back or something. I've only done that a few times in 46 years. But I always ask people to lift their hands because that is the first step of faith before the Lord of showing him. I believe, and what the man has said in the pulpit is true, but how many of you are here that have drifted away from the Lord, that somehow during this whole process of time, you know that you've drifted away? Raise your hand and hold it up real high, and let me just see it. Thank you, sister, brother, sister, there, 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 over in the back, there, there, and over there. All right, God bless you. How many of you have had, uh, I, I just mentioned that there's someone here that has been a little, a, quite upset at the Lord over some things that's happened. And you've even kind of, if I can use this analogy, like shaking your fist and just saying, oh, what are you doing or what are you up to, and became angry. Now, let me tell you something. The Lord understands that. He's not going to you know, send you to hell just because you got angry at him, trust me. But how many of you, who is that that has gone through something and you've been very, thank you, sir. Thank you, this couple back here. Thank you. Is there anybody else that, right here? Yeah, right here. Uh, I don't know why I'm saying this, but I just feel like that there's someone who lost a companion. Uh, maybe it was through, through COVID or an accident of some kind, and uh, you needed that person. You said to God, God, you know I need this person. I need them in my life, and now they're not here. And uh, is that right, right here, right here? Yes. And so I, I want to, here's what I want to do. I, I have to do this this way. On the count of three, that's just a signal. There's nothing special about the number three. But I am going to ask those of you who lifted your hand, just those of you, there's about 20 of you, to stand and walk to the front where the Spirit of God has been moving through the anointing. And let me pray with you. Because a prayer, you'd be surprised how a prayer of faith can start a healing in you, okay? And, uh, and you came today and the Lord knew you were going to be here, all right? And so I want, I want to pray for you. So on the count of three, if you'll just stand. One, everybody that lift your hand. Two, three, right now. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, thank you. And if you will just line up kind of shoulder to shoulder across the front, it'll be fine. We're going to wait on you here. Lord, I want to bless you right now for the people that are coming. I know from experience, I know from my life, that sometimes all it took was a prayer of faith. All it took was one prayer to stop the emotions and the feelings that I had and to turn it around 
And I'm asking you, Lord, in Jesus' name, to touch these. Pastor, do we have a prayer team that can uh, come? If the prayer team in the church, elders or deacons, deaconesses, is a prayer team, will come and stand behind all of these. Would you do that right now? If you're a part of the prayer team here at the church, please do that right now. Come and scatter. There's a lot of people here. I know we got more people than we do the prayer team, but if you'll come. I'm going to ask this whole group in the front to pray a prayer with me out loud. Now, some of this may not apply to some of you, but I just feel like I'll, I'll try to pray the way the Lord's putting in my heart to approach Him. And I want you to repeat it after me. If everybody else will stand in the building in honor to the Lord because we're going to approach the throne right now. And uh, we're going to pray a prayer of restoration for you personally. And then I want to pray for those of you that have, feel a hurt uh, a hurt because of something that's happened recently. Um, and God's going to restore something to you. Let's lift our hands together, everybody. Would all of you pray this prayer with me? Father God, say it out loud. Father God, in Jesus' name, I thank you right now that the word of the Lord has reached into my spirit to help me right now I'm asking you to take out of my heart, out of my spirit, even out of my mind, anything that is a hindrance to walking with you. Lord, if I have sinned in any way or grieved the Holy Spirit, I ask you today <laughs> in Jesus' name to forgive me to cleanse me by Jesus' blood and to help me, Lord, to be stronger in my faith. Restore my faith. Restore my hope. God, please restore my joy because I need this right now in my life. In Jesus' name. Now, I want you to lift your hands and begin to bless the Lord with your words in your own way. Just begin to tell Him. And I want you to express your love for God right now. Can you just express your love for God?